welcome to First Christian Church of Cuyahoga Falls. I'm Pastor Joy Fenton Jones, and whether you are sitting here in the sanctuary on this long holiday weekend or you are worshiping with us via live stream, it is good to be together in community this morning. I'm going to keep reminding you for a couple more weeks that we're uh, endeavoring to keep a little better record of who is with us in worship on Sunday morning. So if you would be willing to help us out by just taking about 10 seconds to fill out one of these little rectangular cards, all we need really is your name and the number of folks who are with you this morning, uh, and certainly anything else you would like us to know or like to include. And you can drop that in the offering plate a little later in the service so that we know who is here with us this morning. As we begin worship, we are going to do what we always do now, which is give ourselves the gift of a minute. So I want to invite you to settle in where you are, to take a couple of good, deep cleansing breaths this morning, and we are going to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship today as we listen to Beth play our prelude. Good morning. Please join with me in the call to worship. When shouts of anger and hostility pound upon our ears, quiet our hearts, O God, to hear your voice. When the arrogance of the world and the carelessness of people threaten to destroy your creation, help us be strong when our service of hope is empty. O oh God, hear our voices and our prayers. Be with us as we come to you. Amen. Please stay standing if you are able and join with us in the gathering song, O oh God of Earth and Altar. And I'm going to ask Joy to kind of step up towards the mic and, and sing out because I'm not familiar with this one as much, and I think that you aren't either, and so I could use a little extra of your finger. <laughs>
be seated. That is a beautiful hymn tune. It's a Welsh folk melody, and I love the tune. It's um, it's kind of haunting and really beautiful, I think. We come now into time of sharing our joys and our concerns with one another. I wonder, Rosemary, would you be willing to pass our microphone this morning? That would be helpful. I'd like to invite you, if you have joys or concerns or thoughts on your heart this morning, um, if you'd like to share those with the community, we will uphold one another in prayer. I have a joy while she's walking. I just want to say that Kylie and Addie had a great time awesome. at Otter Camp. I want to thank all of you who sent a card. And apparently, when you go to Otter Camp, you get rich because those church people include money. In their nice. Money. Yes, her, her family didn't include any, but she was like $15 richer due to the church people. So. All right, so metal note next year, we're all going to Otter right, Camp. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for letting us know she had a great week, too. Uh, yes, first for Don Baird. Mm. He posted uh, at the end of the week that he came down with COVID while on vacation. So we'll keep him in our prayers. Thank you, Steve. So we'll keep Don in our prayers as he's dealing with COVID right now. Jane and I are very happy to have Lindley Hall, who married my cousin, Marcia, how many years ago here? 57. 57 oh. years ago here at this church. Oh, uh, so funny. it's his first time back. Right? And he's been visiting with us from California this week. Well, it's good to have you with us this morning. Welcome. Good morning, and I'm very, very thrilled to be able to be back with uh, folks, a little oral surgery has stifled my getting around, but today is a day that for me will always be the greatest next to the day that I was baptized and chose the Lord, and that was 58 years ago. I married the love of my life, and although he has gone on, He's saving a place for me, and I'm very, very pleased and, and thrilled to know that my love for him grows every day as mm -hmm. it does for the Lord. And I got my daughter to church. <laughs> well, welcome to you as well. Janet, will you remind me what your husband's first name was? Well, it was Willis, but everyone here knows him as Bud. As Bud, thank you. <laughs> um... Um, Gma had a little bit of trouble, um, and she had to go to the hospital, and, um, and I really hope that she felt better, and, and she does, and I'm very happy for her. Thank you. I love being at this church. We love having you at this church. Thank you for that joy this morning. Donna, was she talking about you? That, no. Talking about, okay, okay. I, you looked... Okay, so I for thought, Dima. I thought I'd, I'd mention that uh, there's an obituary in today's station for Bob. Bob. Thank you, Lauren. Just prayers with the city of Akron for everything that's going through for both the sides of, of everybody because it just seems like a bad situation all around. Yeah, thanks, John. All right. Will you join me this morning in a spirit and an attitude of prayer? God, we come before you on a holiday weekend. We might as well say it, the 4th of July weekend. It's a civic holiday. It's a holiday that people all around us are going to celebrate and observe this weekend. And sometimes when we come into these patriotic moments as a, a national community, we can feel a little conflicted. Are we supposed to wish each other a happy 4th of July? Are we supposed to apologize for some of the things that have gone on around us in our communities that um, do give us moment for pause uh, and moments for repentance? The reality is, God, we can come before you this morning with all of it. 
We can be proud to live in the country we do. We can thank you for the freedoms we enjoy, for the opportunities that many of us have access to, and we can also be reflective about mistakes that we have made and continue to make, the things that happen in our communities of which we are not proud. So this morning, we just tell the truth. We bring it all before you, the good and the bad and the places we know we still need to grow. God, we do recognize uh, some real opportunities for celebration this morning. We are joined by family, by friends. Uh, we're joined this morning by an individual who was married in this very sanctuary 57 years ago. And it's a moment for us to appreciate uh, the legacy of a congregation like this one um, and the opportunity to open our doors and welcome folks from different walks of life here. We continue to remember the life of our dear friend, Bob Hively. Um, we're grateful to see his life recognized and appreciated um, in various ways. And we also lift him up as an example of what a patriotic heart looks like, one that is both filled with love of country and a desire to help others, and also um, filled with integrity and a deep sense of honor. So it seems particularly appropriate to thank you for his life and his example this weekend. God, we are grateful to celebrate with some of our young people the gift of presence. It's good to be together this morning, and it's good to be reminded that that's a gift we shouldn't take for granted. So we thank you for the joy of just being here in this church this morning. We're grateful to hear that Kylie and Addie had a safe week at camp that was full of blessings, and we hope that they will be telling positive stories about how you touched their hearts this past week uh, for many weeks ahead. We're grateful uh, for healing to hear that G-Mom is out of the hospital and doing better, and we just recognize your hand at work in her life, in and through doctors and nurses and people who cared for her, and were able to get her quickly back on a road to health and wholeness. We've heard Janet lift up for us a, a resurrection truth this morning, that people's life and legacy and love and the blessing of their presence lives on well past their physical life on this earth. So we celebrate with her on the precious relationship that she and Bud shared and that truth that he indeed awaits her in the life that is to come. God, even as we have so many reasons to be grateful, so many reasons to celebrate, we also recognize that there are people in this church family and in our wider community who are hurting right now. And we wanna take a moment to lift them up to you this morning. We would particularly lift Don up to you someone who has had a tremendous impact on the life of this congregation and continues to do so. And we hear that he is sick right now with COVID. We ask that you would just give him strength in body and spirit, that he would be patient with his own recovery, and that he might very quickly be back on a path to health and wholeness and able to be back among us very soon. And then God, we would lift up all those who were involved in the incident in Akron this past week. We may not know or understand all of the details yet, and we don't need to. You do know what unfolded there, and you know uh, the harm that has been done to all of the people who were involved. We ask that you would just bring your miraculous spirit of healing to that situation, that it would not beget further violence, um, and that the folks who need to stand up and take responsibility would do so. God, we just um, trust in your healing that goes beyond sometimes our own capacity or understanding in that situation. We also recognize that we come before you this morning with things on our own hearts or lingering in the corners of our minds that we may not choose to speak aloud. So we would simply keep silence before you for just a moment, uh, lay our hearts bare, and simply ask that you meet each one of us right where we are. It is in a spirit of hope and grace that we pray together this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
We're going to sing another beautiful hymn together as we close our prayer time. If you use your hymnal, it's number 464, verses 1, 3, and 4 of God of Grace and God of Glory. to invite our children and young people as they would oh i am out of order i'd like to invite christy to come and read our first scripture reading <laughs> i was just so excited to talk to you that i <laughs> our first scripture reading comes from psalm 30. i will extol you O lord for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me O lord my god i cried to you for help and you have healed me O oh Lord, you brought up from my soul, from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but a mo for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger from the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell you of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have turned my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Well, now I'd like to invite the children and young people up to share a word. So last week, if you were here, and it's perfectly fine if you were not, if you were here, I read a children's book. It was a Dr. Seuss book. I like to think it was kind of cute. It had lots of rhymes in it and made us laugh a couple of times. This morning, I would like you to imagine how you would feel or what you would think <clears throat> if I came up and sat down and read you a children's book that went something like this. One day, there was a nice little girl named Bobby, and she went to school. And the first thing she did after she sat down in her desk is she pulled the hair of the person in front of her really hard. And then she laughed at them, and she thought it was funny. Then after that, Bobby went into the closet and stole someone's lunch money. And then she laughed about that, and she also thought it was really funny. And then during recess, she pushed somebody really hard. 
And she laughed at that, and she thought that was really funny. And then it was the end of the school day, and everyone went home. The end. That wasn't very, wasn't very nice. <laughs> it's not very, anyone else have an objection to my children's story? Yeah? It's not very nice. She was mean through the whole thing, yeah. Right? That's a story in which people clearly got hurt. Somebody got their hair pulled. Somebody got their lunch money stolen, so maybe they couldn't even eat lunch that day. And somebody else got shoved on the playground. It's kind of a terrible story, right? Anybody disagree? It's kind of an awful story. You do not disagree. Thank you. I, I was not... So I should not write that one and have it published. Is that kind of what I'm hearing from everyone? Do not write that children's story and get it published? Okay. I want to tell you something this morning. Sometimes we read stories in the Bible where people do things that are not very nice. And I think that sometimes we think to ourselves, well, that's a Bible story, so I'm not allowed to say that that story sounded terrible to me. I'm not allowed to ask any questions, like, why did that happen? Or, is that really okay? Is that really how we're supposed to act toward each other? And I would like to tell you this morning, very clearly, that when you read a story from the Bible, and it does not make sense to you, or it sounds like somebody did something that was wrong, or that they shouldn't have done, you have every right to ask about that. Or to say, that does not sound right to me, and I need to learn some more about it. Or I need some better understanding. Somebody explain that story to me. We're going to hear a story like that this morning. And it's one that I think we have not always asked good questions about. We're going to ask some good questions about it this morning. But I want you to know that you always have permission to ask questions or to be honest when you read a story, even a story in the Bible, that seems like something just isn't quite right. Yeah. Oh, those gift bags, aren't they beautiful? I'm so sorry to tell you they're not for you. Uh-oh, but <laughs> I'm going to tell the congregation and ask for their help with those at the end of the service. But in exciting news, instead of those gift bags, there are snacks and there are juice boxes right there in the front pew that is, are for you. But let's take a second to pray first, okay? Dear God, Dear God. you give us smart brains and we are allowed to use them. So when we read something that seems wrong, it's okay to ask a question. So give us the courage to ask those questions. Amen. All right, go get some snacks. <laughs> We continue our series in Genesis this morning in chapter 6. We're going to read the first 13 verses. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God went in to the daughters of humans who bore children to them, these were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continuously. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. These are the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, 
I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Believe it or not, these are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So maybe if you grew up in the church, you recall a children's song that begins, The Lord said to Noah, there's going to be a floody, floody. The Lord said to Noah, there's going to be Right? Okay, floody. Get those children out of the muddy, muddy, so on. It's catchy, to be sure. In subsequent verses, God does such clever rhyming things as telling Noah to build an arky arky out of gopher barky barky and inviting animals to come in by twosies twosies, elephants and kangaroosies roosies. Before we are told, it rained and poured for 40 long daisies daisies, which understandably drove those animals crazy crazy. Then the sun comes out and dries up the landy landy, after which apparently everything was fine and dandy dandy. Then we get to the big finish, which I am confident many of us know. So rise and shine and give God the glory, glory, and so on it goes, right? I always hate to ruin a classic piece of music for people, but I have to tell you this song has always bugged me. It seems like a narrow reading of Genesis 6 to 8 that would allow us to celebrate the handful of humans and animals supposedly saved on a boat and ignore the fact that God apparently decided to drown everything else in all creation. To then cheerily sing, rise and shine and give God the glory about the carnage seems particularly callous to me. I wasted a few minutes this week trying to come up with a verse that might capture the macabre reality of this story, but honestly, trying to come up with a rhyming phrase for everybody else drowned just didn't turn out to be all that funny. The song notwithstanding, it's odd we tend to think this is a cute story for kids outfitting Sunday school classrooms with wooden arcs and child-sized animals to casually tell one of the most violent and profoundly objectionable stories in the entire Bible. Now let me back off my soapbox here for a second and say that I do not mean to invoke crushing guilt on all those of us who have sung this song, played with those Noah in the Ark toys, or taught Sunday school lessons about this story. I have done all three many times. I would assert that teaching young people to read this story without giving it a second thought might be one of the less thoughtful decisions we make with regard to our education curricula. And as we make progress in our reading and understanding of scripture, we might choose to be circumspect about this story and others like it. It is not one of the finer moments in our biblical narrative. This morning, we read a passage in which God supposedly made the decision to wipe out the created world. Our first order of business must be to get honest about this story and about God's attitudes and behaviors within it. We hear first that people began to multiply. Just a week ago, in our story from Genesis 4, the population count was still small enough to list everybody out by name. For the record, Genesis is not bothered with questions like how in the world people multiplied if they started out with Adam, Eve, and three sons. Clearly, all of this is to be understood loosely, and somehow, as the mythical story goes, humanity has begun to expand in population and in power. We might read this entire passage as a repeated attempt on God's part to limit the degree to which human beings can grow in power and influence. First, God puts a limit on their longevity, lift, limiting them to a lifespan of only 120 years. Now, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that very few human beings have ever lived to 120 years, and ancient humans lived about a quarter of that time on average. But people have always tried to solve the problem of why we have to die at all. The answer proposed by Genesis, as we know, is that we could have been immortal, but something went terribly wrong. So God has limited the human lifespan to 120 years, as the story goes, and then things take a strange turn. The author writes about Nephilim, who supposedly mingled amongst the people, and with a combination of unfamiliar Hebrew words and convoluted grammar, we get the rough impression that these Nephilim are like giant demigod-like creatures who are getting married to humans and having especially large demigod-like offspring. 
If ever there was a moment for us to acknowledge the ways in which our Christian mythology often mimicked or unfolded much like the mythology of other traditions, this would be it. Clearly, we do not still believe in Nephilim. The very concept was probably learned from another ancient people group with whom our authors interacted. Well-meaning Christians have exhausted the limits of linguistics and imagination trying to figure out who these creatures were. Without meaning any disrespect to their work, I think we're off, better off admitting it doesn't really matter. These Nephilim are part of an ancient myth that was lost to history, and that's okay. What matters for our story today is that God was really bothered by the relationship between humanity and these creatures, presumably because it allowed humans to obtain greater power and longevity. The best we can make of the text is that humans were trying to outwit God. If God limited the human lifespan, then no, no, humans were going to find a way to extend it. God, we are told, experienced this as wickedness, and God further asserts that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. The text continues that the Lord was sorry he'd made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So he says, I'm going to blot out from the earth the human beings and the animals, and the creeping things, and the birds of the air. I'm sorry I've made them all. Now, I want to pause and ask us to exercise a bit of logic here. First of all, are we really to suppose that every person in the growing human community was equally evil all at the same time? Surely, out of all the men, women, and children in this growing population, there had to be one nice guy, or one generous woman, or one decently well-behaved kid. It seems absurd to accept God's assertion that the entirety of humanity was evil enough to deserve death. Second, and along similar lines, it's only reasonable to imagine that any group of people would have moments, even if they were violent and exploitative, they would have some redeeming moments of love or consideration for their own children and closest friends. Nobody's pure evil every moment of every day. And third, how did non-humans get implicated in all this? When God makes the determination to blot out from the earth all human beings, he throws in animals and creeping things, which I can only assume are like the lizards and bugs and stuff, and birds of the air. Even if we're willing to concede that the entirety of humanity could truly have been equally and universally evil, what possible reason could there be for killing off their pets? There is no logical answer to any of these questions. If Cain last week fell into a murderous rage, God this week is on a murderous rampage. Logic is nowhere to be found. Next, we're introduced to Noah. We're told he found favor in God's sight, that he was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, that he walked with God. The text also adds that Noah has three sons, though they don't really factor into the story much. The text reiterates that the earth was corrupt and filled with violence. And God turns to Noah and lays it out. I've determined to make an end to all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence. Now I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. I would like to put a question to all of us gathered here today. If you and God were on verbal speaking terms, and God told you about a plan to destroy every living creature on earth, including the vast majority of birds and animals, as well as most of your friends and neighbors, except for a handful who would be permitted on a boat, what would you say? I would like to think that every single one of us would have the moral decency to, at a minimum, ask God to reconsider. Maybe advocate for a few friends and family, ask God to at least spare the children and house pets. It seems to me that a truly moral person would actually implore God to save every living creature on the earth. That's the response I expect from a minimally ethical person. I know the text tells us that Noah was a righteous and blameless man, but I have a hard time imputing righteousness to anyone who would accept the universal slaughter of humanity without so much as a word of objection. But if I'm bold enough to question Noah's silence in the face of his plan, then I must be bold enough to question God's motives as well. Okay, you might be thinking, 
Why go to such great lengths to analyze a story we already know is not historically or factually accurate? There's no doubt that a catastrophic flood happened at some point in this ancient community. And clearly, this story was generated to explain how and why it happened. Why pick apart this particular narrative if we already know full well it didn't happen exactly this way or for these reasons? We analyze stories like this one not because they tell us very much that is accurate about God, thank goodness, but because they tell us something that is accurate about ourselves. This sort of violent, sweeping, ill-considered, retributive, mean-spirited narrative is exactly the sort of idea human beings come up with, either to explain away events for which we have no good explanation or to pin blame for life's circumstances on people we do not like or trust. Let me be clear in saying I believe this story pins blame on God for something I am persuaded God did not and would not do. Human beings wrote this story. We are the ones who come up with ugly narratives like this one. It's easy for the circumstances of our life, lives to derail our convictions sometimes, something we saw just last week as Cain lashed out and killed his own brother. And here, a catastrophic flood actually shaped the way these ancient people were willing to portray God. We can shake our heads and lament their ignorance, except we witness this same phenomenon in our own time. John Hudson writes in The Atlantic, assigning moral blame for natural disasters is becoming a sort of time-honored custom in some circles of Christianity. When Pat Robertson claimed that the earthquake in Haiti was caused by its people's pact with the devil, nobody was that surprised. Other evangelical ministers have pinned a number of tragic large-scale disasters on the victims. After 9-11, after Hurricane Katrina, in response to the AIDS epidemic that has ravaged Africa. These are recent examples, but I think it's the same human impulse that legitimized rounding up Japanese Americans after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and placing them in internment camps. It's the impulse that leads to continuing anti-Muslim sentiment in this country, justified by the abhorrent actions of a small number of extremists. It's the impulse that excuses all sorts of racism and gender bias, ageism, anti-immigrant sentiment, fear of people with various health or mental health conditions, discrimination against people who have a criminal record, and any number of attitudes and behaviors we are all too quick to justify. Christians, and indeed I would assert most religious people, have historically been eager to accept God's care and forgiveness for us, and just as quick to assert God's imagined condemnation, judgment, or even extermination of those we have decided are the other people. It is a theme we must confront again and again in our scripture, and it's a reality we must also confront in our shared humanity. What are we to do with all this? What good can we possibly derive from a violent old story that affirms our worst human impulses? Well, for one thing, sometimes I think we have to be honest about the deepest, darkest, ugliest corners of our hearts if we want to bring matters into the open and create some change. Many of our most intractable problems, from the inequity of how we fund our schools, to the treatment of migrants at the border, to our inability to collaborate across party lines, are rooted in the dark truth that we like to protect our people with abysmally less regard for those we deem other. There's a hard but hopeful truth, though, that I don't think we ever talk about when we read this story. Even in the story, God's or perhaps humanity's little extermination plan, it didn't work. This wasn't the end of evil, because we don't get rid of evil by wiping out everybody we perceive as our enemies. That is evil. Whatever the path to redemption, whatever the path to salvation, this isn't it. It isn't wiping out the pagans or the infidels or the unbelievers or the wicked people out there who are doing something we have convinced ourselves makes them worse than we are. Evil exists 
in everybody. The path to salvation begins with facing that reality and letting go of any notion we might have that we can simply get rid of people who think or live their lives differently than we do. This is Fourth of July weekend. Many of us have the day off tomorrow, and we look forward to picnics and fireworks and civic events in honor of our country. I realize that Independence Day is not a liturgical holiday, but I don't like to ignore what's going on in the world around us. Our families and our communities are going to celebrate Independence Day tomorrow, so I think it's appropriate we talk about it here. So often when we attempt to talk about our national identity in the context of our faith, we find ourselves retreating behind comfortable party lines and either bashing the United States into the ground for its many faults and failings, or defending her honor to the hilt and refusing to admit any mistake, however small, ever. Perhaps we might try a more moderate approach today. It is not dishonest to say this is a great nation. We can celebrate our progress and also acknowledge we have a long way to go. Conversely, it is not disloyal to admit our faults. We can admit we have made some big mistakes and also be proud to be American. This country has had some Noah and the Ark moments. We have lashed out in anger. We have sought to obliterate those we perceived as our enemies, even when our anger was misguided or misdirected or just excessive. We have harmed individuals, communities, and even nations sometimes. We have caused moral injury to our soldiers, to their families, and to all of us who bear the knowledge of these actions. This church family said farewell to a great man last weekend. Bob Hively understood the moral consequences of violence, and he made a principled decision to live a both-and reality, both to serve his country on the field of battle and to do so while committing himself to nonviolence. It seems fitting this morning on this 4th of July weekend that we might honor his memory by being both and people too. Let us have enough integrity to admit where we have gone wrong sometimes. Let us also have pride in all we have accomplished and all we do stand for as a country. I believe we are learning that we thrive when others thrive, that the United States is greatest not when we stand over others, but when we partner with them. And whatever your political disposition, let us all be thankful for the freedom we do enjoy and the opportunity we have to be a beacon of hope and welcome to our neighbors. Happy Fourth of July, and may God bless all people in all nations. Amen. We move now to a time of responding to God's word. I want to say a word about this song we're going to sing. It is lovely. The words are stunning, and this is a both-and kind of hymn. It expresses pride in our national identity, and it also extols the pride that others have in the places they live. So as we sing it, I would really encourage you to pay attention to the words and take them to heart on this holiday weekend. We're going to sing This Is My Song, number 722, in your hymnal.
as you can see, I forgot to get someone to pass the offering plate this morning. That was my responsibility. So we are going to dedicate this offering right as Rosemary is gracious enough to come down the aisles and collect it. Will you pray with me the prayer of dedication that will be up on the screen? Patient and loving God, we are reminded throughout Scripture that you are slow to anger and quick to forgive. Yet we forget those promises and we give in to our own short tempers. Forgive us our intolerance of one another and use our gifts this morning to further your grace in our world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We come now into time of preparing our hearts for communion. I will remind you that we've been receiving communion by inviting everyone down the center aisle. There will be one station in the center to receive the bread. You can travel to either station on either side to receive the cup and then return to your seats by way of the side aisle. I will also remind you that our table is open for everyone always all the time. So you do not need to be a member of this or any church to receive communion here this morning. We're going to prepare our hearts by singing together a song from your praise binder, Made Me Glad. We come to that time in our service when we receive the tangible gifts our Lord bestowed upon us. We ask that you think deeply, as deeply as you can, for our country, for our church, for ourselves. For it was on the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And I often wonder if his table was as noisy as mine sometimes <laughs> was with all the children talking at the same time. And hopefully they listened when he said, 
This is my body, which is for you. So do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after they had finished eating, he took the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it. In remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim my death. You make it real. Whenever you eat the bread, whenever you drink the cup, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Will you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, it is with mixed emotions that we come to this special time. We know we need you more than ever. We ask that the bread and the cup stay with us throughout the hours and days ahead. Help us to honor those who gave their lives in service to our country. We pray for peace, peace among all nations and to all people. Please place your loving arms around us. Make us worthy of the gift of freedom and life eternal through your son's death and sacrifice. Amen.
have just a couple of announcements for you this morning. First and foremost, uh, there is no car show tomorrow. Enjoy the 4th of, the day, uh, 4th of July holiday, um, and the car show is going to take a rest, and then we will be back out there on Monday, July 11th. I do know that if you want to volunteer for some of those remaining Mondays in July, you can see Connie, and I'm sure that she would love to have you. Sign-up sheets are right out there on the desk. I also need to ask for your help with a little project this morning. Um, the aforementioned gift bags are sitting up here at the front of the congregation. They are for some of the friends and family of this, of, of this church family who are not able to always be with us on Sunday mornings. I have some cards. Um, they have names and addresses attached to them. And the request is if you would be willing to write an encouraging note to someone in our church family and then deliver the card and a gift bag to them this week, most of them are right here in Cuyahoga Falls. There's one in Talmadge. Um, so if you'd be willing to participate in this little effort to spread some 4th of July weekend cheer, I would greatly appreciate it, and I'll stand up here uh, following the service. With those announcements before us, I'll invite you to stand as you're able, whether that's in body or in spirit, and we are going to sing together God of the Ages, number 725, in our hymnals, verses 1, 2, and 4. you to go from this place with a joyful spirit uh, to celebrate all that we are privileged to enjoy all that we have access to and to be determined in our shared humanity to share those gifts those blessings with each other go in peace amen mm -hmm. 